you want to send for coming to the lecture. Here is a, a brief introduction to our speaker. Nicholas James is a postdoctoral neuroscientist at the G Lab, UPCOR team of the Center for Neuroscience and Brain Mind Institute of the Life Science School at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institution of Technology in Lausanne. As part of this, he's working on developing neuroprosthetic systems, robotic interfaces, and advanced neurohabilitation procedures in combination with neurogenerative interventions on rodent and primate models. Um, so so some, some complex words and all of that. But I see a rodents, and I see robots and uh, brains and scientists. This research seeks to understand the processes that can enable the re-establishment of motor functions after neuromotor disorders and thus enable animals and humans to regain partial or full mobility. Dr. James will give a lecture entitled Reversing Paralysis with Neuroprosthetics. So thank you very much for joining us um, and we very much look forward to your lecture. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'll just share my screen now and get started. So, okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, and, and like Dr. Hughes said, I'm going to give you a talk entitled Reversing Paralysis with Neuroprosthetics. Um, I work at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, um, so EPFL, and specifically I work as part of this research team called NeuroRestore. Um, and NeuroRestore is this big group of research scientists like myself from a huge variety of different scientific backgrounds. And so like myself, there's a number of neuroscientists and molecular biologists, engineers, computational modelers, all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, and we're all kind of working together with this one common aim of being able to restore function in patients with some form of neurological disorder. Um, so in order to do that, I will give a kind of early disclaimer that's already been alluded to. We do do um, animal research. So anyone who's kind of sensitive to that, I do kind of welcome any questions about that at the end. I think it's very important to have open discussions about the importance and the ethical issues around animal research. And I know from uh, a little birdie telling me that it's also one of your um, key questions or of your universal learning program for the school this year relates to whether animals should have rights. And I do think that's a, a very important question um, and one that I'm very happy to discuss. Um, so NeuroRestore itself is broken down into kind of three separate divisions. Here in Geneva, the part that I work in, um, we work on, let me just get a little pointer up. Um, we work on small animal models. Uh, and this is the mechanistic and preclinical division um, of NeuroRestore. Um, so here we do kind of like the foundation work of really, really beginning to develop a therapy and working out the mechanisms through which it actually works. Um, and that's where small animal models are extremely important. And um, once we have technology or a treatment that we think can be effective, that then goes to our division, the translational division, which is in Fribourg. And there they work on primate models. And it's very important that any therapy that is developed for human use is tested in a much uh, in a species that's much closer to a human, so a normally a non-human primate. Um, and this is also where we have like the big testing of our really, really advanced technologies is in primates. And then finally, we have a, a big team over at the University Hospital in Lausanne, SHU, okay. where we do our translational, our real uh, translated work, where it's in patients. Um, so to break down this title a little bit, this reversing paralysis using neuroprosthetics, first of all, what is a neuroprosthetic? Uh, it's simply defined as a device that can enhance the input or output of a neural system. And the neural system being any part of the nervous system. So that's brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves. And um, all of the nervous system works through its communication is through electrical signals. 
but the most obvious way for us to modulate or alter uh, any function in the nervous system is through electricity. So generally we can record electrical signals and we can artificially induce electrical signals simply by applying an electrical current to the brain or spinal cord or to a nerve. And this example here, um, I'm gonna go into more detail later, but this is an example of a neuroprosthetic that we've developed. Um, I'll also state at the beginning here that whilst I'm gonna give you a talk of what the whole kind of NeuroRestore team has done, uh, this is work that's gone on for over a decade now. I've just been here for the last few years. So this is very much not going to be me taking credit for doing all of this work at all. It's a, it's a huge team effort. <laughs> Uh, so the other part of this title, paralysis, uh, there's another um, uh, many forms of paralysis and one of the kind of most common causes of it is a spinal cord injury. Um, so spinal cord injuries are a severe trauma to the spinal cord, which is obviously a key component of your nervous system. It's typically caused by a trauma. So the bone around the cord will break and this will impinge on the soft spinal cord inside leading to uh, some form of paralysis often, um, and these are caused by accidents, typically car accidents are the most common form um, of trauma that lead to a spinal cord injury. Falls are also a very common form uh, of accident leading to spinal cord injury or sporting accidents. And like I said, typically this leads to some form of paralysis as the most obvious outward symptom. Um, there are actually a huge plethora of symptoms that are associated with spinal cord injury, but paralysis is the most obvious and most kind of clear to the patients as well as the people seeing them. Um, so I assume that most of the uh, students at the school will be far too young to recognize this guy on the right hand side here. Some of the teachers might know. This is probably the most famous individual who um, had a spinal cord injury. His name's Christopher Reeve uh, and he was the original Superman. So even Superman can get a spinal cord injury. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background before going into how we've been developing treatments for this, uh, central nervous system itself is made up of the brain and spinal cord, as you can see here. Um, as I alluded to previously, it works by sending electrical signals, and this is how it communicates with all of the rest of the body. And to give a gross oversimplification of how the central nervous system itself, the brain can kind of be thought of as this complex computer where all of the kind of high-powered processing goes on, and then the spinal cord is this um, big, thick electrical cable that sends all of the signals from the brain to the rest of the body and equally from the rest of the body back to the brain. So we need to kind of, uh, our brain tells the body to move, for example, and then we also have sensations so we can feel things and that signal comes from your periphery and comes back in through the spinal cord up to the brain so that you actually feel it. Uh, we'll focus specifically on the spinal cord because we're gonna be looking at the spinal cord injury leading to paralysis. Um, and the spinal cord, like I say, is this kind of highway of communication from the brain to the rest of the body and vice versa. And um, it can send thousands of messages to and from the brain every minute. And these are sent as electrical signals by these particular specialized nerve uh, neurons. They're called, so they're a specialized um, cell in the body, nerve cell. Um, and you can kind of think of them as if you cut open a uh, any kind of electronic cable. Uh, I don't recommend doing this, but in the name of science, you could, and just make sure it's not plugged in. And you'll see that it's filled with tiny little metal wires. And those thin, thin metal wires, you can kind of compare to a neuron. It's really, really the thin little strands within the, the cable. These are the neurons running up and down the cord, sending all of the electrical signals to and from the brain and the rest of the body. So what happens when someone has a spinal cord injury? is that the, this kind of communication to and from the brain is disrupted. So a contusion is a type of spinal cord injury, the most common form, it's just a blunt trauma to the cord. Um, and what you see here is that the brain is trying to send signals to the rest of the body and where that injury is, uh, those signals are no longer effectively getting through to the rest of the body. So a signal can be sent down, it's blocked where the cord is injured, and then it can no longer effectively communicate with the rest of the body. Um, and what's important here is that unlike the rest of the body where if you cut your hand or damage yourself somehow or get a bruise, it will repair nicely. The central nervous system does not repair at all. There is uh, no way of the body naturally recovering from a spinal cord injury. So we have to develop treatments to help with that. And so what we see is that even in a patient or an animal model where it's completely and utterly paralyzed by the injury, this is a spinal cord here, 
Um, and all of these white things we have coming down are the nerve cells, these axons of the nerve cells traveling down the spinal cord. And here we have the contusion, and this animal, uh, in this case, would have been completely paralyzed, no function left at all. But what we see is that some of those axons are actually spared by the injury. So there are some nerve cells that survive and they pass through the spinal cord, um, but they're no longer sufficient to lead to any kind of function. And that's very, very important because that's what we take advantage of to develop our, our therapies. So this is what a, a rat looks like when it's completely paralyzed. You can see after this injury, those fibers are there. They're completely silent. The animal is not able to move its legs at all. It's completely flaccid. Um, however, what is the kind of big advantage or big kind of thing that we're able to take advantage of is that where you have this injury high up on the spinal cord, down here in the lumbar area of the spinal cord, which is what's responsible for your leg movements, all of the neuronal circuitry here remains completely intact and healthy. And it's a little bit changed by the fact there's an injury above it, but all of the necessary uh, neurons that are needed for walking are all still there. So we can take advantage of that. And like I say, because everything in the spinal cord works with electrical signals, we can apply artificial electrical signals to the spinal cord um, using electrodes that we implant on top of the spinal cord. And this can therefore lead to the restoration of walking. So this is just an electrical current being applied over the cord. As soon as it's turned off, the rat can't walk anymore. And as soon as it's back on, it's up and walking again. However, what you will notice here is that if we just watch that video one more time, and pay attention to what the rat's kind of doing here. It's walking on a treadmill here, and the rat with its head is really, really not paying attention to what it's doing at all. It's looking around towards the end, it starts grooming. It's really, really, it has no idea that it's actually walking. And this is what we call automated stepping. So because there's kind of sensory feedback coming from the fact it's walking on a treadmill, and we're giving this extra electrical stimulation over the spinal cord, this is enough to make the animal automatically walk without it really even knowing what it's doing. And um, so it's great. Yes, we can make the legs walk, but obviously if you want to put this in a patient, you want the patient to be kind of walking of their own accord, not really because there's a treadmill moving underneath them and they don't really know what's going on. So in order to move away from this automated involuntary stepping, what the team at NeuroRestore had to do was they built this robotic interface to help with the rehabilitation uh, post-injury. And what this does is it, gives multi-dimensional weight support um, from all three, all three dimensions. So up and down, left and right, forwards and backwards. And it means that in order for the rat to be able to walk, it really, really has to use its brain to kind of give a command to walk forwards. Um, initially, like you've seen, the animals are completely paralyzed. This brain signal will not reach the lower cord. But if we give them a few weeks of training on the treadmill with this electrical stimulation of their spinal cord, uh, giving them that kind of beginning to regain some sort of stepping function. And then you also start to put them on this robot where they have to really, really force themselves forwards over weeks and weeks and weeks where you're really, really putting them through this intensive rehabilitation. What gradually happens is you get a rat that no longer is just kind of sitting there doing automated stepping on a treadmill, but with the stimulation and with the weeks and weeks of rehab, it can push itself to now walk again. So you'll see this again in a second close up. You see it's really, really returning to form almost normal stepping in these hind limbs. And the reason we put them in this kind of strange upright position in a jacket is that the injury we're giving them is only impairing their hind limbs. And if you allow a rat to walk normally with its forelimbs and hind limbs, it doesn't pay much attention to its hind limbs at all if they're injured. So we have to really, really force them to use their hind limbs. And this is another kind of important part of the rehabilitation is forcing use of the impaired limbs. So, as I kind of mentioned earlier, one of the really, really big advantages of being able to use animal models in our research is that it means that we can gain a much greater understanding of how our treatments are actually working and how best to apply them. Um, so these are really, really a, a vital advantage of, of animal studies. So we have things like microscope work where we can look at changes in anatomy. We have techniques like electrophysiology where we um, record the nervous system when we record how things are changing within the nervous system and therefore we can know more about what we're activating how it's being activated and why it's important and then this down here is a very very new technique and um, that has a 
cool visualization, but means very little in visualization form, but it's this thing called single cell sequencing. Um, and it means we can really, really look at how changes are taking effect in the spinal cord at the single cell level. And we really know what exact cells of the spinal cord we're targeting with our, our treatments. So we have this huge and complex tool of techniques that allow us to gain a greater understanding of the uh, mechanisms underlying any recovery, but also how to improve our treatment more, because if we understand more about how it works, then we're able to optimize the treatment and really make it much more targeted and, and better at restoring the functions we're interested in restoring. So I'm just gonna go through one of those kind of cool and cutting edge techniques that we've been using a lot recently, um, which is called clarity. Um, and it's called that because we get much greater clarity of what's going on in the nervous system. So up here in the top right, you can see what a normal uh, rodent CNS looks like, so brain and spinal cord. It's normally very, very white or yellow uh, because it's filled with fats. This is the myelin that's around all of the nerve cells. And what we do is put it through this process of clarity, which completely clears the tissue and makes it completely transparent. So the reason we want to do this is that we can then use uh, some specialized equipment called a light sheet microscope. Um, and unlike any kind of normal microscope, uh, this produces, so a normal microscope produces a tiny, tiny little pinpoint of light so that you can look at one tiny, tiny little region in very, very high detail. What a light sheet microscope does is, as the name suggests, produces an entire sheet of light um, in one plane, so one dimension, a completely flat sheet of light. And that means that that light can shine through that entire piece of cleared tissue, so the whole brain and spinal cord, and instead of just imaging one tiny little specialized point within the tissue, we can image the entire brain and spinal cord all at once. And you get images like this, where what we've done is we've put some fluorescent markers into two different neuronal pathways in a mouse brain and spinal cord. So once the video stops, I'll point out what they are. But basically, these are neurons that descend from the brain all the way through the brain and down into the spinal cord. And this is a very important pathway responsible for initiating locomotion. And that's the red pathway. And then the blue pathway is the exact opposite direction of communication. These are neurons that are either in the spinal cord or out in the periphery, and they project all the way up the spinal cord and into the brain. And these are important more for sensory function. So in orange, we've got a pathway that's very, very important for motor function, and blue, a pathway that's very, very important for sensory function. And um, so this, having this sort of technique allows us to look in really, really great detail what's actually happening when we apply our therapies and we know therefore what's going on in the central nervous system and how we can kind of more appropriately target that. So an example of this being used was that this therapy I've been talking to you about where we apply electrical stimulation to the lumbar area of the cord with intensive rehabilitation. We cleared a cord and um, a spinal cord after that. And we can see here the injury in the middle of the spinal cord and then two different neurons that are two different neuronal pathways that descend from the brain. And we see that the white one, which we're looking at here, where it comes through the lesion, normally without any treatment or any kind of rehabilitation, these fibers would remain kind of just at the side of the, the spinal cord and not really do much else. Whereas after all of this stimulation and rehabilitation, they sprout everywhere into the spinal cord and they form all sorts of new connections. And that's how they're gradually managing to restore kind of locomotor function, helping these animals to walk again, because they're producing much more function than they were before. We've allowed them to kind of regrow almost and sprout out all over the cord and form new important connections to initiate locomotion. And having had this kind of mechanistic, first of all, the initial treatment development and then this mechanistic understanding, it means that therefore we can take these sorts of treatments forward and use them in patients. And so here we have a patient over at the at Shuv, the University Hospital in Lausanne, um, who's been with us for a number of years now, but this was right at the very, very beginning, before he's had any kind of rehabilitation. This is just testing out his stimulation, uh, and he is almost fully paralyzed in one leg. In fact, his foot was fully paralyzed, and the other leg was almost fully paralyzed. Um, and he was, I think, five years post-injury, so completely uh, stabilized in terms of his recovery and completely unable to walk. He was in a wheelchair. And this is him. As soon as the stimulation is turned on in his spinal cord, he's now able to walk with this kind of similar robotic support. 
uh, stimulation off, really, really can't move those legs at all. And stimulation comes back on and he's now able to move those legs again. He's still absolutely not supporting his own full body weight. He's got this robotic support working with him and a physiotherapist helping kind of uh, keep him stable from side to side. Um, but just like with the rodents, we put him through this big intensive rehabilitation treatment where every day he came into the lab and he's having getting the stimulation, walking from one side of the room to the other. And over time, in fact, over five months, he then, by the end of that, is getting this similar kind of process going on where any kind of spared nerve fibers around his injury are able to sprout more and more in the tissue beneath or below the spinal cord injury and create new connections, and um, just like in the rodents. And what that leads to is that five months after he'd begun this therapy, he is now able to walk across this walkway without any stimulation at all. So this is pure, complete recovery. Uh, well, not complete recovery, but completely spontaneous movement on his part. There is no therapy going on just now. This is just the function that he's managed to regain from going through all of this rehabilitation and stimulation. And if we do, do turn the stimulation back on, obviously he can walk even better than this. And in order for him to be able to use the stimulation in kind of a, a real world situation, the labs had to develop these kind of um, neural technologies that are available for the kind of real world situations. So implanted in him, has, he has his electrodes on his spinal cord that will give the stimulation and we have to be able to communicate with those. So um, he has this little communication system that is also part of um, how we send a signal to the spinal cord um, and to those electrodes that are on the spinal cord. Um, and that is communicated to the um, IPG, it's called as a stimulation system, uh, through this vice control on his watch. So he can tell the stimulation to begin when he wants to be able to start walking. Um, so he speaks into his watch, tells the stimulation to start, and he's then able, with the assistance of a walker, to be able to, to walk along in a, in a real world situation. So this is really, really an example of a, a therapy that's developed from very, very early stages over 10 years ago in rats and mice and gone all the way through um, and now is kind of in this real world situation in patients. Uh, so we've shown you this one kind of prime example of the, the first patient that was treated here in the lab, but this is now moving on and it's going into more and more patients now. So we have nine patients now um, with chronic injuries who've been implanted with these devices. Immediately, all of them um, are able to show some form of locomotor activity depending on how severe their injury was. Um, with the stimulation on, and they're now going through all of this intensive rehabilitation to kind of regain that natural function that doesn't even need the stimulation. Um, so that's one kind of big success story from the lab. Uh, we work on a number of other things, and I'm just going to give you a couple of kind of ongoing things just now in the lab. Um, so one of them, in fact, is an example really, really of how we can further the technology that we're using. So at the moment, all of that stimulation that these people are getting is what we call open loop stimulation. It's not controlled by the, um, the body at all. It's just a set pattern of stimulation in the spinal cord that leads to locomotion or it helps to move the legs basically. Whereas to make that more kind of natural, what we really, really would like to be able to do is record um, electrical signals in the brain where we can then detect the intention to walk and how that person or animal in this instance wants to walk. And so like lift up left leg, put down left leg, lift up right leg, put down right leg. We can record those intentions in the brain and then we translate them using what we call a neural decoder where we are able to convert those electrical signals into a real kind of intention using a computer and we know what the brain is intending to do and then we translate that into an electrical signal sent directly to the spinal cord to send the appropriate electrical signal to the right area of the spinal cord and restore that kind of walking behavior naturally. So it's really just bypassing the injury site. We take the intention from the brain and we take it directly to the spinal cord where it normally couldn't get because there's an injury in the way. So we have these electrodes in the brain recording all of these intentions. Um, it's, it takes a signal which is wirelessly sent via a computer to our stimulation device, and it stimulates this appropriate pattern of activity in the lumbar spinal cord, restoring locomotion in the legs. 
So what this looks like in practice is this. It's called a brain spinal interface. And this is with a monkey walking along on a treadmill, unable to use its leg, which had been paralyzed. And then as soon as we turn the brain machine interface on, movement is restored in this leg. And this is purely controlled by the rat, the, the monkey's brain, sorry. And as soon as we disconnect that, the leg is completely paralyzed again, and it just goes to using its other three limbs. So this is one of the kind of the big advances in technology we're working towards now being able to apply in humans as well, where we can take electrical signals from the brain and translate them directly into appropriate spinal cord stimulation. And another slightly uh, less invasive way we're thinking of doing this as well is taking signals from the muscles in the limbs themselves. So instead of having to read signals from the brain, what we can do here um, is instead of looking, so this is looking now at the cervical area of the spinal cord, which is responsible for the upper limbs. So we've obviously had a, a lot of kind of success now in being able to restore lower limb function. And we want to translate that to now being able to restore some function in upper limbs as well. And this is a slightly complex looking slide. But basically this is how translating that therapy to the upper limbs looks at the beginning, where we have to do a lot of mechanistic work and what we want to do is we inject a, a tracer, it's called, into different muscles of the upper limb. And then what that does is it basically sends a dye back along the nerves into the actual motor neurons. So these are the neurons that are responsible for moving your muscles in the spinal cord. And you get these colors lighting up in the spinal cord for the different muscles of the upper limbs. So the two most obvious muscles of the upper limbs are the biceps and the triceps. And if we trace the motor neurons that are responsible for controlling those muscles, we see where all of the kind of motor neurons are in the spinal cord for those muscles. And knowing where those muscles are is very, very important for our stimulation because it means we can stimulate the right area of the spinal cord to then kind of lead to a response or a movement of the biceps or of the triceps. And that importantly would give us, biceps would give us flexion of the arm and triceps would give us extension of the arm. So this is kind of the beginning of how these therapies uh, initiate, is that we need to know where to stimulate the spinal cord to get appropriate movements. And um, so now that we've kind of been working on this for a while, what we've done, actually I'll show you in fact, how kind of precise we can be with our stimulation. So if we simulate the area of the cervical spinal cord that leads to biceps movement, we get a nice flexion of the arm. So you see that arm pulling in immediately as soon as the stimulation is turned on. With the triceps, you get the opposite. The arm pings backwards and extends fully. Um, and if we stimulate even further down on the spinal cord, we can control the opening of the hand um, itself. So we can have arm flexion, extension, and opening of the hand as well. And these are all clearly very important movements in, in upper limb control. Um, and what we're now working on for that is we want to build a kind of body machine interface where activity, so there's always some form of residual activity in the muscles of the upper limb, even when a patient is paralyzed. There's still a little bit of activity going on in the muscles. And we want to be able to detect that activity in each muscle, so biceps, triceps, or in the, in the hand. And when we detect activity in that muscle, it sends a signal directly to the spinal cord to stimulate the appropriate area of the spinal cord. So the biceps would stimulate up at C5, which was this level that I said was responsible for biceps function. Any activity in the triceps leads to stimulation down here, and any activity in the digits leads to stimulation down here. And it means that as an animal or a human attempts to move their arm at all, we basically give the spinal cord an extra boost of stimulation in the appropriate region so that we can kind of enhance what they're trying to do where the brain isn't quite able to get the full kind of degree of its intentions through the injury. And that's where we're at just now with being able to help people with upper limb function rather than lower limb function. Um, and having got you kind of to that point, I would just like to say, first of all, thank you to all of you for listening. And then this is the, the huge team of all of the researchers involved at in Neuroresource. So it really is a, a massive team effort doing all of this work uh, and getting to this point. So thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any or if there's time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. James. That was really uh, stimulating. Um, intellectually stimulating. Uh,
something that is physically stimulating, um, but the ego, the fun. Um, and let's see if we have any questions in the chat. So I'm going to ask if um, if any of the students have questions, if their mentors maybe get those in the chat. Um, or, or anyone on the call, any questions that you can put in the chat for Dr. James. One student question. Any estimate about the time length until the D-mode independent mobility could be made more broadly available? Um. So, any estimate about the length, until it, as in until this is widely available to patients, I believe, is what they're asking. So, yeah, I would imagine. Yes, it says yes. Yeah. So, you, you, time scale is going to be so at the moment it's going into a multi trial, multi center trial just now um, over the whole world. And um, so, I think we have five different institutions that are implementing this in kind of a clinical trial basis. And I would think that as long as that is all successful within the next five years, this should be available for patients. Um, obviously, particularly at the beginning of a development of a complex system like this, a neuroprosthetic, it's in certain countries, it will be widely available and um, depending on how rich that country is. In other countries, it's gonna depend on what the kind of healthcare system is like and what kind of um, insurance models there are, for example, um, but widely available um, within five years, I would say, as long as the multi-center trial goes successfully. Within five years, okay, thank you. Did you see the other question? I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand it, but it says, is the biological build of a rat any problem? So I guess this relates to more kind of the, the biological differences between a, a rodent model and, and a human model. Um, and yes, there are very, very clear um, differences between, between the two, um, particularly the, the rat is quadrupedal. It uses all four of its limbs to walk and uh, a human is bipedal. Um, and this is why we have this, this translational division where anything that has been kind of successful in, in rodents, before we can go into humans, we have to test it in, in a non-human primate model. Uh, and this is very, very important because there are these kind of not gross, but noticeable biological differences between a, a rodent and a human. But they are also, in terms of the functioning of their central nervous system, extremely similar. But thankfully, we don't really run into too many issues with there being uh, a, a really noticeable difference in, in how neuroprosthetic treatments work between a rodent and a human. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's significant uh, biological differences between a, a rodent and a human. That's a, that's a positive thought for the day, at least. I had my doubts, but uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, so I think we all we have this question about the the risks of the intervention. Um, so there, there's no kind of so far detected risks um, in terms of the stimulation itself can't do anything negative. And um, one of the problems can be that these patients, uh, because they have lost sensory function as well as motor function, they're sometimes not able to tell if they're kind of pushing too hard with the, with the rehabilitation. Um, and not in our study, but in a study performed by another group, there was a patient who was continuing to train, even though he actually had um, some down, a broken bone in his hip, basically, um, and he wasn't really able to know that this was there. Um, but generally, the, all of the physicians, as is the case for us, the physicians should be keeping very, very uh, kind of detailed track of this, and they should never allow a patient to get to this stage. And um, so as long as the physicians in charge are really, really doing their job properly, there shouldn't be any uh, risks at all, to be honest. Uh, and just to go straight on to the next question about the wireless communication. So for the wireless communication, is there any platform for security being considered? Uh, so this is very much not my area of expertise, but obviously with, with these kind of body machine interfaces or wireless interfaces controlling simulation of the body, this is a major concern that if someone is able to kind of like hack into this and control the stimulation there, I mean, it's obviously something straight out of a sci-fi film where someone ends up controlling someone else's legs and making them walk around doing things they don't want to do. 
Um, so yes, I know that this is um, something that's very much being kind of closely examined and put a lot of effort being put into making this as, as secure as possible. The wireless connection between any of these devices is uh, a clear and obvious kind of not threat, but risk um, of using a wireless stimulation technology. So it is part of the startup company that develops all of our devices for once they go into humans. There's a huge chunk of that company that's devoted to making this as secure as possible. And last question that's up there just now is what are the key ethical obstacles you had to face when injuring the animals? Um, and yes, this is a very, very good question because there are many, many ethical obstacles, not just with injuring the animals, but with doing animal research in general. Um, I myself come from a, a zoology background. My undergraduate degree was really, really looking at kind of love of animals. Basically, I was really, really interested in animal biology in general. Um, so coming into a lab where we research on animals was, was a big kind of change mentally for me. Um, and I think you have to, with all animal research, you have to kind of come into it with the mindset of benefits and costs. So is what we're doing really, really necessary? Does it have to be done in animals? And what kind of benefit can we actually get from it? Is it going to really, really make a difference to kind of the world um, or people's lives? Can it improve people's life quality? People, for example, working on treatments for, for cancer, they obviously we have to develop a treatment for all of the numerous forms of cancer there are, um, and that has to be tested in animals first. It's, it's obviously completely impossible to go directly into a human with these treatments. Um, and there you see that the, the kind of benefit of it, possibly depending on your, your opinions on, on animals, do outweigh the costs. We need to develop these treatments. I mean, any medical treatment that has ever been used basically has been tested on animals. It has to go through that stage, um, unfortunately. But we do have to also take into consideration while we're doing this research to minimize the kind of impact on animals. So use as few as possible, minimize any kind of suffering that they go through um, and make sure that we're really, really making the most out of any animal models we're using at all. Uh, so we really need to optimize absolutely everything to, to minimize the use of animals in research. Dr. James, uh, on behalf of the, the students and the teachers and the whole school, I'd like to thank you so much for that talk. It was very passionate and full of mastery. Um, fascinating uh, and really inspirational to see the work that you're doing and how science can lead to a better world. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you for taking the questions. And um, I hope that everybody on the call has a great day. Let's, let's show our gratitude uh, and appreciation. If you're able to turn on the microphones, we'll give some applause to our speaker. Thank you very much for having me and for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Thanks very much and have a great day. Thank you, all of you too. Bye. Bye-bye.